Welcome to the Oral History Criminology Project. We are here today in Philadelphia at the American Society of Criminology meetings in 2017. My name is Sally Simpson and I am pleased to interview Candace Critchnett of the University of Toronto about her life and distinguished career in criminology and criminal justice. By way of introduction, Candace, I am going to say a little bit about your position, your past positions, your education, your honors, and then I'm going to ask you whether I have missed something that you would like me to emphasize. So, by way of introduction, Candace Critchnett is currently a professor of sociology at the University of Toronto. Previously, she was professor of sociology, department chair, and interim associate dean at the University of Minnesota. For her education, she received her MA, Master of Philosophy and PhD at Yale University in Sociology. She received a bachelor's degree in criminology from the University of California, Berkeley. She has a variety of honors that she has received both in the United States and Canada and internationally. She is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, Social Science Division, um, ASC fellow, president of the American Society of Criminology, past National Academy of Sciences Committee on Crime Law and Justice, and a, an Academy panel member on measuring rape and sexual assault. She was also a member of the OJJDP Girls Study Group. She won the Distinguished Scholars Award from the American Society of Criminology Women's Division, and she's been a visiting fellow at the Institute of Criminology in Cambridge University and a visiting fellow at the Netherlands Institute for the Study of Crime and Law Enforcement. In addition to these honors, Candace has received numerous invited lectures, citations, and awards. She has a long history of funded research, five books and major reports, and approximately 54 refereed articles. Have I missed something? No. <laughs> I forgot about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that distinguished record, you clearly have, I think, some important observations and experiences that you can share with um, criminologists now and in the future. So, on becoming a criminologist, what brought you to criminology? Uh, I was an uh, undergraduate at Berkeley, and at that time they had the infamous School of Criminology, mm -hmm. Sheldon Messenger. Tony Platt, the Schwendingers, um, who am I leaving out? It, Barry Crisberg, it was an amazing group. But at any rate, you couldn't get in, and I didn't even think about it, but I was taking like a general abnormal psych class, mm -hmm. and a friend of mine said, if you like abnormal psychology, you should take this course taught by Bernard Diamond called The Etiology of Crime from a Psychiatric Perspective. Mm -hmm. And I sat there that semester absolutely entranced. And so then I applied. You couldn't get into the school until your junior year. So I applied to get in in my junior year. And it was just an amazing experience. Then I thought, of course, that I had my BA in criminology. I'll have there'd be all these job offers I would get, right? And none came through. But I, uh, I applied to, to VISTA. Volunteers mm -hmm. in Service to America, which is kind of at that time was the Domestic Peace Corps. Mm -hmm. And they uh, looked at my background and said, okay, we'll take you, you have a choice. You can either uh, go to work in a drug rehab program or you could go to a street gangs project. Mm. And I went, well, the street gangs project <laughs> could be so much more interesting than <laughs> drug rehab. So I uh, flew to the South Bronx, flew to New York, went to the South Bronx, and worked for a year in the South Bronx. And we had a program where we tried to get these young offenders probated uh, to a local program rather than sent to an upstate institution. And it was a really fascinating uh, year. And during that year, I decided I wanted to go to graduate school. What was it about the experience that made you think you wanted to go to graduate school? It was just, it was so fascinating. I mean, these people, they, they were uh, primarily Puerto Ricans. They would have big parties. They would, it would be like 
the normal coat check at a party, only they were checking their weapons as they came <laughs> in, right? The, the women who were affiliates of the gang would always gave me these tips, you know, don't ever, don't ever look like you're even thinking about flirting with some guy, here's what's going to happen if you do. It was just layer upon layer of a fascinating experience and I thought I, I just have to go on in this area. Okay, um, let's move on to some of your, um, your mentors. You talked about mentors at the undergraduate mm -hmm. level. Did you have mentors when you were in graduate school at Yale? Yes. Donald Black for sure. I mean, and and I went in part. One of the reasons that I, uh, Yale was very appealing is at that time they had um, an array of of famous criminologists. They had Kai Erickson, they had Stanton Wheeler, they had Al Reese, and they had uh, and I didn't know Donald Black, but. Um, Al, which I have mentioned before, um, we had a required organizations course, and I was very excited that Al Reese was there. Um, and there were only two women, myself and Bernice Pesca Salito in the cohort. And when we sat down the first day for our organization seminar with Professor Reese, he looked at Bernice and myself, and he said, the two of you are taking seats that could be occupied by men earning PhDs for their wives. Well, my enthusiasm for Al Reese just fell to the floor. And then at the point where you have to, I, you had to start studying for your comps, I was looking for a faculty member that I could talk to um, and review some of the material with. And Donna Black was wide open and said, sure, I'll go through you know, the whole process with you. He was wonderful. And um, then when it came to thinking about my dissertation topic, I approached him. And he turned it on its head and in a way that just amazed me. I was, there was a little teeny article in the New York Times uh, bouncing off of Frida Adler's book mm -hmm. about the, the increase in arrest rates for women. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Maybe that should be the topic. I went in to talk to him about it. And of course, his perspective was all about social control. Mm -hmm. So how do we know that there's any change in arrest rates? Maybe we should think about this as a change in social control. Women are more likely to get arrested. Brilliant, right? Mm -hmm. So I ended Because of the <coughs> decrease in social control. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So I ended up doing my, my dissertation uh, and testing, at that time his book had just come out, um, The Behavior of Law, and testing a number of the propositions in his theory. So he, he was a big influence. Um, what about influences for your interest in, in gender? Oh, well wait, I should also note, I can't leave out David Ward. Oh, when yes. I was at the University of Minnesota, in fact, David Ward hired me. Mm -hmm. I was at one of those job interviews. <laughs> People think they're <laughs> worthless, right? Oh, it's an ASA. <laughs> yeah, it was mm -hmm. an ASA, mm -hmm. American Sociological Association job interview. And I met David Ward, and I was like, wow, there's David Ward, right? And he ended up hiring me at the University of Minnesota and was one of the most fascinating men, but also one of the funnest. You could go up to his office and just let it out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you always left laughing. He was tremendous. He was also a department chair for a long time. And so I think I learned a lot about being department chair from him. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other person I have to say was when I was an associate dean, Bob Holt was in the political science department. And he was phenomenal, just phenomenal. He never worried about the budget, although he was supposed to. For him, it was all about ideas. What are the great ideas? He was wow. just an inspiration. Was he in his position very long? He was no. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he should have been, but he wasn't. Yeah, no, that's what happens to people with great ideas, <laughs> yeah. and they don't care about the budget. Um, OK, um, that's great. Um, on your body of work. Yeah. Is there a major theme around which all of your work coheres, or are there several small agendas? Well, I'd say it all coheres around gender and crime, but within that broad rubric, I've worked on women as offenders, as victims, and as prison inmates. So mm -hmm. a kind of, you know, there, there, there's a cluster of articles in each of those areas. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And when you look back on your career, on projects or bodies of work that you have produced, of, of which 
are you the most proud? Well, I wasn't, you know, I think it, some of the early work on sentencing was quite good. Mm -hmm. um, I concur. <laughs> I think the early work on sentencing, which, which really flowed from, from uh, my dissertation and working with Donald Black, um, I think subsequently I, I was quite, uh, quite, I'm quite proud of the project I did with Rosemary Gardner on the women's prisons in California. Um, that was a big project, and I and I think it was it was important. And then finally, of course, the weave of women's experiences of violence, which Sally was involved in, Julie Horney and Rosemary, where we looked at uh, women's experiences with violence and victimization in three different cities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if we talk a little bit more about those specific projects, what do you find? most meaningful in them? What do you, what kind of contribution do you think, this is a question that she doesn't know about, but I'm, <laughs> I'm probing now. What, what do you think is the most salient or significant about those and why are they, why did they rise to your well, most pride? They, with the exception of the sentencing research, they involved a lot of collaboration. And I, I think collaboration is dynamic, whether it's with graduate students or with your, your colleagues, because you always learn something. Mm -hmm. There's always people who've thought of something you haven't thought of. There's something that, that makes, that they say that can set off a spark for you. So I think the collaboration, the give and take is, is really wonderful. Mm -hmm. What kind of impact do you think that work has had in terms of maybe changing the way people think about women's imprisonment, for instance. Yeah. It's a very timely work yeah. that you and Rosemary did, yeah. especially coming in the era of mass incarceration yeah. and more women percentage. And orange is the new black. <laughs> that too, that too. People could, could relate to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, and, and identifying, kind of going backward to some of the old prison literature, the yeah. imprisonment literature, but also giving a whole new spin on it in terms yeah. of women's carceral experiences within yeah. these different institutional environments. Right. And what factors mattered more in one environment versus another environment. Yeah. I think those were really important contributions. Yeah. I have my students read almost all of her work, so <laughs> it, it isn't a crime, a crime um, women crime and justice class, it's a homage to Candace Gretchen's no, work. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I do think the, the, the prison project, in part, not just because it was uh, across time and holding time constant, looking at two different institutions today, it had both components, mm -hmm. but it's also because, I mean, let's face it, women's imprisonment is the bottom of the barrel. I mean, there are small numbers relative to men's imprisonment. People don't talk about it. They don't care that much about it. And yet, what happened to men with mass incarceration also happened to women. And it fundamentally did change the way they were dealt with. Mm -hmm. And now we have the, the next wave of it, of course, is the gender responsive assessment tools. and. Well, and, and women returning to the community after this right. incarceration right. incident and what their needs and, and issues are in the community. Right. Um, in terms of the Women's Experience of Violence yeah. Project, yeah. why do you think that particularly is important? Oh. You talked a little bit about this, I think, in your presidential address, but, you know, the way in which we think about gender yes. and violence. Yes, yes, and, and I think we people tend to certain not the educated criminological population, but I think the lay people often think that the only time women commit violence is in response to victimization. And you and I both know that women can be very violent without it being self-defense. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that project uh, had ample evidence of it in it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, um, reflecting on your career for a minute, mm -hmm. what would you say your identifying characteristics are as a scholar? Um, I think probably I've bridged the quantitative, qualitative uh, divide. Um, I don't think there's any reason to believe one camp is better than the other, and I think the mutual interchange of the two is is the ideal world. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I mean, 
and I would hope creative ideas. I would add enthusiasm to the <laughs> subject. <laughs> um, would you have done anything differently if you were starting over again? Yes. Um, when I was at Minnesota, uh, I had a colleague, very wonderful, smart woman, uh, Jane McLeod, who's now at Indiana University. And we put in this enormous grant to NIMH to, to do a longitudinal prospective study of child abuse. Now, th these take about a year to put together. They're huge, right? So we put it in and it came back. It didn't get funded, but the score was close, right? Mm -hmm. And so the funding agent was, oh no, you're really close, don't give up. So we did it again. <laughs> Right? Another year. Another year, <laughs> right? We put it in, right? And this eats up time you could be writing articles or other things, right? Same thing. Oh, you're so close. I, you know, this goes to uh, young scholars, I would say, know when to hold them and know when to fold them. And, and I should have folded after the second round, just gone, that's it, it's not going anywhere. I did after the third, but that's just an incredible waste of time. I learned a lot in mm -hmm. the process, but it was it was not a good decision on moving forward. Do you think that has to do with um, the benefits that come along with getting a grant like that for a young scholar? Or yes. You oh, I think that's true. I mean, there is a lot of pressure to get external funding. Um, I know at least at Minnesota there was for, for promotions and raises. Um, but it also facilitates your own career, right? To be able to have money to produce new articles and, and new research. So I think, yeah, there is a lot of pressure to get external funding. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of future generations watching this, mm -hmm. um, what would your advice be besides folding them in a grant situation? <laughs> um, holding, no one to hold. Or no one to hold, when to fold. When to fold. Um, is, is there something that contributes to success in criminology more broadly? What do you think it takes to be successful in this discipline? I think you need to consult broadly. I think the more people you send your work to, um, to get comments, to get feedback, particularly people who aren't necessarily in your area. So you're writing an article on um, uh, the mental health of prisoners send it to some mental health experts who aren't criminologists, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or you're interested in uh, gender crime and work, send it to somebody who does work in occupations, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I, I just think uh, the broader the consultation you get, read widely is another thing mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. is really important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what's your mentoring philosophy? Uh, similar, I would say consult, I would say vet and work hard. There, there aren't <laughs> any shortcuts to getting those articles out, right? That you just have to put your head down and, and get it done. And I also think, um, you know, I try to emphasize to students that it, it, the publication process should be like a train. So that you've got one article out, right? You know that odds are it's going to come back for a revision. Mm -hmm. So Get, get started on the next one while you're waiting, right? Just line them up, right? Um, so that you have a constant flow of work rather than dead periods. That's a good analogy. Peter Rossi used to say it's like having four pots on the stove and they're all at different stages yeah. of the boil. Yeah, it's exactly right. Mm -hmm. It's exactly mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. It's like a train that's choo-chooing along. You got the one at the front, but you got to have some behind there. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. also you don't always know what's going to happen to the one in the front. It could crash it and could burn. It could crash and burn. <laughs> that's absolutely right. Um, what are your general thoughts on the intellectual or slash professional state of our field? I have two. One is, I wish it was less faddish. And by that I mean, I would say for a good 10 years or decade, it was life course mm -hmm. and desistance, right? And now it's mass incarceration. And I'd like to see a little less of that and a little more uh, mixture of different kinds of, I mean, it's like people hop on a bandwagon, you know, and when it gets. And the other thing is, I, I think that the, the quantitative qualitative divisiveness is, 
is hopefully it's over, but that's there's I can still see remnants of it in my own department. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What do you think contributes to the faddishness? Do you think it's popular culture? Do you think it's that that's where the money is in terms of funding? What well, do you think contributes to that? I think money has something to do with it, but I also think if people read the journals and they go, wow, there are four articles on mass imprisonment or the collateral consequences of mass imprisonment, they think that's what I should be working on, right? That's what's going to get my name out there in with these people who are working on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that contributes to it as well. How would you negate that? As a white collar crime person, <laughs> she said. As somebody who can't place anything in the mainstream journals. <laughs> but, but see, I mean, I don't, you know, maybe in part it's, the, I, I can't blame the editors because they have what they have to work with, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. they, they can't choose what people send in. Um, but I think given um, a so pipeline it's a pipe it's a pipeline it's a pipeline issue, issue. issue. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think in part it is a pipeline issue but certainly you could say uh, in graduate school when you're mentoring students right which way do you want to go are you going to hop on a sub subject that's been beaten to death or are you going to and and also students have to realize that the amount of literature they're going to have to review and find some tweak in what's going to be different that they're doing is it's harder to it's, do it when it's harder. Been, yeah. yeah okay um, do you think there are questions the field ought to be studying and they're not corporate crime <laughs> <laughs> i concur <laughs> <laughs> no, that is a serious one when you think about how often that uh, comes in. I, I think one of the interesting things right now is, and, and, and this is hot off the press, but I think sexual harassment, which has, has you know, I, I remember when I was in uh, graduate school, a young assistant professor, mm -hmm. that was a hot topic because that's at a point where all of a sudden it was no longer okay for professors to date graduate mm -hmm. students, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. it, be it became this turning point and everyone thought things were going to change. So I think that's something that's ebbed and flowed and I think it's quite fascinating right now that we're seeing this huge outpouring. Whether, whether anything will happen with that, I don't know, but I think it is you know. Another place where popular culture may actually influence. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is there anything I haven't asked you that you think merits inclusion on this record? Something else you'd like to add? The only thing I can think of is uh, I really found my time abroad in England and the Netherlands quite important because it exposes you to a whole different way of thinking about the criminal justice system, um, about thinking about criminology than being seeped in America. And, and, and I, I, I really encourage people to take advantage of those kinds of opportunities when they come up because you not only extend your network in invaluable ways, but it also broadens your horizon and makes you really think differently about criminal justice issues. Mm -hmm. I remember I, when I was uh, in the Netherlands at lunch one day, everybody always ate lunch together. Um, now that's a tradition yeah, you should do. Yeah, and um, there was a horrible story about this guy in Austria who had uh, buried one of his children in an underground shelter and then had a child with that the, the, you know, okay. she'd been there years and years and it was an awful case. They just discovered it and I thought, oh my God, in America, the guy would be, you know, strung up, you know, sentenced to 150 years in prison, blah, blah. And I said at lunch, what do you think they, they will do in this case? And they all looked at me and said, well, he's obviously mentally ill. He'll go to an institution for mentally ill people. It wasn't even an issue of criminal justice. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And that's what I mean about how it just so changes your perspective. Or one time when I was in a woman's prison in the Netherlands and the, their, their prison population had bumped up slightly, which is not, it's nothing to even think about in terms of how, you know. How ours has bumped yes, up. Yeah. Uh, but they were the first, for the first time considering double-selling women. And I, and I looked at the, 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 the 
governor, equivalent of a warden of the prison, and I said, well, what if those two women have a relationship? Because homosexual mm -hmm. relationships in this country in prison are foreboding, right? And she looked at me and she said, wouldn't it be wonderful for them? <laughs> and that's what I mean about it just, you know, makes you pause and think about your own values, about the own your own workings of mm -hmm. your uh, your own biases. Your yeah, own, and mm -hmm. and the way we structure our policy uh, uh, priorities around this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, okay, that's all I have for you. Thank, Thank you, you, Thank you, Sally. <laughs>